So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the myths that we've been fed throughout the years about the so called welfare queen. Mm -hmm. First of all, where did that originate from? Who was she? And why did she get that title? Well, apparently, the phrase welfare queen comes from around the 1970s when the Chicago Tribune published a story about a woman named Linda Taylor. Now, Linda Taylor has been widely known to be a black woman, but in reality, her racial makeup is much more complicated than people realize. And she was also accused of constantly changing her racial identity, but that was always described in the context of trying to rip taxpayers off in order to take advantage of welfare. But I, that actually wasn't the case. Right. So I wanna first start off with what Ronald Reagan had to say about her when he was uh, you know, the leader of this country. Take a look. In Chicago, they found a woman who holds the record. She used 80 names, 30 addresses, 15 telephone numbers, to collect food stamps, social security, veterans benefits for four non-existent deceased veterans husbands, as well as welfare. Her tax-free cash income alone has been running $150,000 a year. Which is not true at all. Which is not true at all, it's crazy. So uh, first of all, when it comes to Taylor changing her identity, mm -hmm. what was really behind that? Now, first, let me just say that her so-called so you know, welfare scams were not as bad as what's being portrayed. But more importantly, her actual crimes were way worse, right? right? So she possibly um, kidnapped and killed three people. Right, there were, there were like serious criminal allegations surrounding her, but everybody commits murder, everybody commits kidnapping only Thieving black women steal from the federal government. It's a, it's and at that point, politically, that was necessary. That, that's what they that's what they wanted to do. And you and using this in an effort to strip away much needed help to a lot of uh, people of color, to a lot of marginalized communities. That's right. That's right. And so. Um, Josh Levin, who wrote a book about this and also recently wrote an op-ed about Linda Taylor in the New York Times, says that, look, she, she, she was a complicated figure. I'm not trying to make her seem like she was a, a good person. She clearly wasn't. She was a known kidnapper. And in the 1970s and 1980s, three people she'd become close to ended up dead under suspicious circumstances. Those disturbing incidents were never adequately investigated. So there's there's that, like she right, was a obviously a bad person. Right. but. Instead of focusing on that, she was again known for welfare fraud, which was used as a political tool. And welfare turned to turned from an entitlement to a very temporary assistance type program under the Clinton administration because of this type of political messaging. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about her race because okay. she actually what I mean we don't she, even we don't really know. know we don't know we know her mother was white and that yes. as a child she was marked white. On the United States on the census. That's right. We don't know much about her father. Right. Uh, but here is, a, I think, a better explanation of why she changed her race uh, depending on where she was applying or where she was living. Take a look. In the 70s, she was coded as being black. People perceived welfare recipients at that point mm. as being black. But some of the first stories about her noted that she could change her identity by changing a wig, that she could be black or white or Latina or Filipina. And this was seen as just another example of her deviousness. But as I found in my research, her history with race is far more complicated and in many ways sad. She was born in the Deep South and was rejected by her white relatives due to her you know, mixed race identity. She was somebody who was forced to pass because of the way growing up as a black person in a white family. Mm. In the South, it was illegal for her to be black in certain circumstances. It's just a very complicated and fraught history for her. So this is really about the intentions for 
changing her race? Was it done to commit fraudulent crimes? Or was it done because it was literally a necessity to survive depending on where you were living? Because if you're in the deep south and you have a white mother with a black child, that is literally illegal at that time. Right. They can't admit that her mother would face jail time. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, it's such a crazy and, story. And later on, like later on in life, she was involved in some other, because we're not saying she wasn't a scammer. She was. Later on in life, she was involved in some other scammer. She was trying to get some money out of some somebody's estate and her family came to testify against her. And her mother at that point still not wanting to admit that she had this, what we looks a half black child, mm -hmm. said that it wasn't her child, she didn't give birth to her, that she was dropped off at her front porch, on her front porch, which she was three months old, which is tragic and evil and awful. And I want to point out that um, that one hundred fifty thousand dollar a year that has been that is still repeated now. People I know it's think amazing that you can get a six figure salary from government assistance. When she was charged, it was like what nine thousand dollars. Yeah, it was it was a it was a much smaller sum of money around nine thousand yeah. dollars. And again, yes, she she was committing crimes, she certainly did try to scam a gambling mogul or something yeah. like that out of money. She tried to claim that she had some sort of relationship with him and that he owed her that money. And of course that case didn't go through because she had absolutely no evidence for it. But nonetheless, I mean, her crime related to welfare fraud was definitely inflated and even though she had possibly committed worse crimes, much worse crimes, she was never known for that because she was used as a political tool to basically push for austerity, to push for cuts in welfare spending. Yeah. And it's it's a really, it gives you a sense of why we are where we are today when it comes to this issue. Here on the Damage Report, we talk a lot about the big banks and their ways of getting rich off the poor. They saturate the market, but there are other options. And I've got info on a socially and environmentally responsible financial institution that has no ATM fees, gives you cash back on every purchase. They even commit 10% of their earnings to charity. It's called Aspiration, and if you go to aspiration.com slash TYT to sign up, you'll get these perks and that's more money to spend or save or to spend, just treat yourself.